loves speculating about God. Not just does God exist, but diverse ways God could be. In searching, striving to know God, if there is a God, I immerse myself in contrasting views. Though I doubt I'm any, well, closer to truth, I'm seeing a larger landscape of possibilities. I need to push further, diversify more, speculate more, extend the landscape, generate multiple models as to what God, if there is a God, may be like. Sure, God or no God would answer big questions about meaning, or purpose, or eternal life. And the search itself gives insight into how humans think. But there's another reason. I love speculating about God. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and this is Closer to Truth. Is it permissible to speculate about God? Or is God too holy and our imaginations too sinful? That's what some believers think. They surmise that by indulging in speculation, I'm committing blasphemy. I'm not of their camp and I'm not fearful. The kind of God that I hope exists would appreciate, even enjoy, humans speculating about God. I start by examining speculation itself with Australian philosopher Peter Forrest. Peter, I struggle with God. I want to know if I'm going to believe that a God exists, what is this God like? Uh, but people say we shouldn't speculate about God. There are two reasons, I think, why we should speculate about these matters. One is that it does seem to me wise, sensible, to make a choice if you have to commit yourself when you see what the options are, rather than to have simply have a take it or leave it approach. The other reason is that there are well-known intellectual obstacles in the way of people's religious traditions. Although one approach is just a sort of stone wall and sort of refuse to answer these things, a better approach, I think, is to offer something by way of a defence and a speculative defense. We have in the Western tradition the Judeo-Christian God. Normally, that's what you take or leave, but you want me to expand my repertoire. Well, well first of all, people talk about the God of the philosophers. How does that differ? The God of the philosophers is the sort of God you would be inclined to think quite likely without looking at claims to revelation or without looking at human traditions, to religious traditions. And the God of the philosophers actually, I think, comes out rather nasty. And the God of the philosophers is a kind of utilitarian who chooses for the best, but in a way that doesn't care for individuals. So the God of the philosophers is a God who provides a fairly satisfactory intellectual explanation of why the world is as it is and to whom the problem of evil is not an enormous problem because the God of the philosophers takes the big picture and we're just some little part of this and it's for the general good. The problem of evil and I think the whole issue of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is a God who loves and whose love is not restricted, loves everyone, everything. And the world just doesn't really look that way. So you've got this sort of tension between the claims that God is, is, is loving and kind and the God of the philosophers who's satisfying intellectual explanation of things but doesn't really care for us as individuals. I, I guess there are, there are a number of possibilities that we should be thinking about here and one of them is how God relates to the universe as a whole. Traditionally, Christians have been worried about pantheist or near-pantheist views. I attribute that worry to the mistaken view that 
we pretty much understand or understood the world around us. Science reveals there's so much more to the universe and suggests that it's no longer demeaning to God to think of the universe as God's body. So we've got this whole dimension now of the transcendence and imminence of God. And those who don't like to speculate will say that, well, God is both imminent and transcendent. Which means? Which means that God is within us all, God's imminence, but God is totally different and other and incomprehensible, which is God's transcendence. I think that's a cop-out. But if you're going to be serious about it, you can't simply say, oh, on the one hand, God is transcendent. On the other hand, God is imminent. You've got to say what's going on here. So you've got a whole spectrum of views. And I incline towards the sort of more pantheist end of the spectrum. This range of speculations then was in order to provide a number of models as to how God might be without claiming to know how God actually is but without, on the other hand, lapsing into some kind of pious and, I think, annoying silence in which you say, oh, no, who are little we to think about these things, which just sort of annoys the hell out of me. I'm with Peter, eager to speculate about metaphysics and God, especially about the metaphysics of God. Get a wide range of views, not just drill down on one. Scan that landscape of possibilities. But is that landscape singular? Or are there two different kinds of landscapes? One for the God of religion and one for the God of the philosophers. Perhaps a historical perspective can help. I speak with Berkeley philosopher Hubert Dreyfus. From Plato and Aristotle on, there have been some views about the supreme being, the good in Plato, which was eternal, and the prime mover in Aristotle, and then in the Middle Ages, there was always trying to figure out the properties of the supreme being, and one of the most important properties, namely existence, yeah. and whether being the supreme being, he didn't have to have existence, this <laughs> famous ontological argument. Yeah. All of that was getting nowhere when my hero comes on the scene, Pascal. Pascal is a very religious person and a brilliant mathematician and a super good philosopher. And what he says, he makes two moves. One, the first move is already terrific. He says the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not the God of the philosophers. So all this debate about the supreme being that Plato and Aristotle and the medieval mm -hmm. supposed Christians are involved in is just irrelevant to us uh, Judeo-Christians. Mm -hmm. And that sounds right. How did that differ though from the God of the philosophers? Well, Good, that's exactly the question. Their God was a present God, having all the positive possible properties, as they sometimes uh, yeah, said. Yeah, yeah. A God that the, that the mind could contemplate. Mm. And Pascal said, our God is a hidden God. He's never present, you can't see him. And then the, the, the Jewish thing, you can't make pictures of him. Yes. That's important. If you don't understand that, you don't understand this whole tradition that's been off the rails because the point is you can prove the existence of God and you can prove the non-existence of God. That's what they've been doing, yeah, yeah. but they haven't realized that that shows that God's not available for that kind of understanding. Mm. You could say God was the unrepresentable. That's the most important thing about God, mm. according to Pascal. Mm. And that gets you to Kierkegaard, who, leaning on Pascal, makes a big deal about the difference between what he calls metaphysical religions, religions who think that you can have a vision of God. That's a kind of religion, but it's got nothing to do with Judeo-Christian religion. None of the Jews ever got this kind of vision right, of God. Right. The best they got was a burning bush. Yeah. And it turns out it's very important that G they could see Jesus, the Christians. And in some sense, Jesus was God. But Kierkegaard says once Jesus is here, there is no access to God the Father. Even though Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen, seen the God Father. Father. Good, that's the perfect thing. That's Kierkegaard's line. Yeah. Because since he says that, there's nothing more to see. Yeah. Not <laughs> just in spite of it, but because Jesus uh -huh. says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, yeah. you know all you'll ever get to know about it, it. So stop debating it. <laughs> and you've got to Enough. Well, Jesus, what more do you want? You've got Jesus. The next really important step is Nietzsche, who wants to say that certainly the God of the philosophers isn't 
uh, anything we can know anything about or need to know anything mm -hmm. about. But that God in general no longer plays any important role in our culture. And he expresses that by saying God is dead and we have killed him. We have killed him by presumably partly sort of misunderstanding him and doing philosophy about him, <laughs> and partly by becoming, he says, so good at understanding people's desires that they, and, and being honest about our desires that we discover how much we need God, but that we haven't any evidence and therefore we have no right to believe in him anymore. And that's the end of what Nietzsche calls monotonotheism, <laughs> and, uh, which he thought was a bad idea from the start. And he says he likes polytheism. Now, polytheism is a wonderful minor thread here because in polytheism, you don't have a supreme being and Nietzsche puts it all together by saying sort of the God of the philosophers is dead. It didn't work out and we don't need it. <laughs> to Bert, collating history, one key is whether God is representable. One view of God that is surely representable and surely not of the philosophers is the Jewish God. I guess I should know about this. The Jewish God often features struggle. The name Israel literally means struggles with God. Rabbi Neil Gilman explains his own struggles. My late teacher, Abraham Joshua Heschel, referred to moments of radical amazement moments which is much more than wonder and much more than curiosity. It's even much more than awe. It's a sense of the intrusion into the everyday of the realm of the transcendent. Those are the moments that I consider to be revelatory. And I put God into those moments. You've and talked about having to deal with tensions and polarities, that God's all-powerful and somehow either vulnerable, kind and cruel. And, and omnipotent and limited, and involved and distant. So is, I, I, is one there... of the things that I'm convinced about is that tension is good. Tension is a source of vitality, is a sort of source of creativity. Out of tension, out of the push and the pull of contradictory impulses comes a sense of the possibilities, the creativity of that. Because that, mo that. most would see the polarities and the tensions with God as problems to be solved and resolved and done away with, the problem of evil or the I, problem I, of God. Uh, look, I've been doing this for too long. I haven't been able to get, it, get rid of the tensions. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I've given up trying, I guess, and resolved that I just, you just have to live with the polarities. The, the God, at least the God of, of the Jewish tradition, is beyond human knowledge. Uh, we cannot grasp God in our thinking, in language. God is beyond. God transcends it. Which means we're left with precious few alternatives. One is to lapse into, into a kind of worshipful silence, which is what the mystics do, <laughs> or stop asking, which as a philosopher I have difficulty doing. And the other is to speak of God in human language. And we use um, classical word as metaphors, allegories, constructs. Now, in, in Judaism, we don't see God. And so what do we know? No is far too intellectual a word. I don't think we can say that we know very much, but I think we can say legitimately we have a sense of God's presence or we put God into our experience of the world and then we say a lot. For a tradition that says you can't say anything about God, it says an awful lot about God, but it says it using figurative language. Um, God is a warrior, God is a shepherd, God is a judge on the high holidays, God is a parent, God is a lover, God is a friend. These are human ways of referring to God. And I think the danger is, of course, to see them as literally, literally true. The thing about this God is that this God, at least the, the God that emerges in the biblical narrative, doesn't have it all together. Mm. God is a notable failure. If God had it all together, why didn't he get the world in better shape from the outset? Why Adam and Eve's rebellion? Why Cain's murdering his brother? He begins, the first chapter of Genesis ends with saying that God looked at all that he had created and behold, it's very good, tov ma'od. Hmm. By the end of chapter six of Genesis, he gets rid of the whole thing. The whole thing. <laughs> what kind of a God is this? who at the beginning is so proud of his success and a little bit later sees that it didn't work out. Probably one of his big mistakes was to give humanity freedom. 
Because once human beings are freed, then human beings are free to screw up the world. And then God sort of wants to take responsibility for this. And what does that say about the nature of God? That God creates humanity to participate in the redemption of the world. That God needs people. God needed God needs people. God needs people. This is a very needy God. God needed people. God needed Israel. God needed the covenant uh, with with a certain people, in order to bring redemption to history. When you think of it, it's a crazy idea, but it's absolutely brilliant because God could could have created the perfect world at the outcome. The story of the creation, the story of the Garden of Eden, emerged out of a profoundly human need to explain. Uh, what is it all about? Why are we here? And what is our role in history? To bring redemption to the world, a redemption which God could not or chose not to at the outset um, inject into the world all by God's self. I too struggle with God, but I still love speculating about God, which invigorates, stimulates new thinking about God. But why restrict my speculations to Western religions? For my introduction to the Hindu or Vedic traditions, I meet computer scientist and philosopher Sabesh Kak. There's a very interesting dialogue in one of the Upanishads, which are philosophical texts, which are a part of the Vedic texts um, as explanatory material, where the question is, how many gods are there? And the response by the sage is that there are 3,000, so many hundred gods. And then the second question is, but how many gods are there? Yeah. The question, answer is 33. But how many gods are there? Three. Yeah. But how many gods are there? One yeah. and a half. Yeah. Okay, so what is the understanding? The understanding of multiplicity of divinity is the various capacities that we have within our inner sky. So each one of them was labeled as a god. Now we could say that love of freedom is encapsulated in the conception of a goddess, which we call freedom, and so on. But to step back, there were two great gods, Vishnu and Shiva. Vishnu is the god of the moral law, and Shiva is the god of freedom, that each one of us is governed by moral law, that is Vishnu, but we also have freedom. And this freedom is something which is both dangerous aspects, which is a constructive aspect, which gives us capacities to do, but it can also put us into all kinds of troubles or difficulties. And that is the dance of Shiva. But in order to approach and reach Vishnu or Shiva, we have to go through our material self, which is our nature, who's goddess. And therefore, the pathway to either of the two great gods is through the goddess. So that we have these abstract philosophers who say there is only one reality, like uh, the great uh, Vedantic philosopher called Shankara. But in his own private practice, he worshipped the goddess. Because really, you can only go to the highest abstraction through your own personal self, which has the form of your body. It sounds like the term God is being used in a different way than it is in the Western monotheistic religions. It's not some dramatically external, almighty, all-powerful being or beings that have created the universe in some way. It seems like the terms are very different. They are. They are in the way they are normally understood. But there's also the conception that all of reality is Brahman, is what we are a part of. So all of reality is God and we are a part of the body of that God. So this is how I think we can see the uh, Judeo-Christian or Western traditions in a manner which are not all that different from the Hindu view of divinity. God, whether singular or multiple, would imbue the world with deep meaning. But without the traditional God or gods, could the world still have deep meaning? How could that be? 
Atheistic philosopher John Schellenberg enlightens me. Well, I have another option for you. It uh, rests on two distinctions. First of all, the distinction between theism and any other similarly detailed religious claim of the present, and a much more general claim I call ultimism, which is just the claim that there is a reality that is ultimate in the nature of things, that is metaphysically, ultimate in value, that is, it embodies the greatest value, unsurpassably great value, and ultimate soteriologically, which means that it is in relation to this reality that our own ultimate good can be achieved, okay? That is a very general claim, which doesn't entail theism, even though theism entails it, and so does every other religious claim. It's, you could call ultimism the basic or the central religious claim. So if you make a shift from theism and other detailed claims to ultimism, that's the one shift that I would emphasize. The second is a shift from talking about belief. And I'm thinking here about what philosophers call propositional belief, belief in response to a proposition like the proposition that there is a God or an ultimate divine reality. A shift from thinking about belief to thinking instead about imaginative faith. People tend to construe faith as though it entails belief, as though it requires belief. I don't think that's the case. I think there's an important distinction that philosophers can help us to see between belief and faith. So if you make the one shift from theism and other detailed claims to ultimism, and the other shift from belief to faith, then a new possibility emerges. Instead of having theistic belief or any other detailed religious belief, you could have ultimistic imaginative faith. Now, I said there was a scientific point, and that is a point about the very early stage we may be in, uh, in a very, very long process of evolution. So against that backdrop, thinking about ourselves as being at a very early stage of religious development, this idea of ultimistic faith, I call it skeptical faith because it doesn't involve belief, mm -hmm. just imagination. Well, it's certainly uh, significantly different from a purely naturalistic, physicalistic world. Right, in fact, that's one of its implications that naturalism is false. Mm -hmm. If ultimism is true, naturalism is false. Perhaps though, naturalism is true and ultimism is false. And if ultimism is false, then so are theism, deism, pantheism, and all the other non-natural isms. It's high time I ask a real atheist to deal with my speculating about God, philosopher Michael Tooley. Michael, as theologians try their best to demonstrate the existence of God, it seems like their definition of God gets narrower. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, the way that I conceive of God is as a person who's very powerful, possibly all-powerful, very knowledgeable, and so on, right? And some theologians complain that that's an anthropomorphic conception of God, right? And uh, they want to move on to some more sophisticated, refined conception. And an example is Tillich. I mean, Tillich maintained that God was not a being, right? but instead there was something like being itself. It seems that this move is a move away from a God that has obvious uh, importance to human beings, who makes it likely that when we die, we're not just going to rot, we're going to survive, uh, makes it likely that very evil individuals will not triumph at the end, to a conception of God as being itself. And the question is, why should I care about that? What, does this give me any reason for thinking that in the end that justice will triumph? Does it give me any reason for thinking that death will not be an end of an individual? And seeing the answer, it doesn't. So, so what theologians, some would do, is in, in attempting to make God more and more likely, they are in fact making God more and more irrelevant. Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, if you ask me, do I think it's likely that being itself exists? I mean, a bit puzzled by the question, but I'm inclined to say, yeah, that sounds okay, yeah, right? So they can get you to admit that their God exists, that's right, yes. but their God is vacuous. Yes, right. I mean, so, you know, if we accept Tillich's definition of God, I might turn out to be a theist rather than atheist, <laughs> right? But I say, it seems to me that what I'm accepting is not something that, you know, makes a significant difference to my life or the lives of others. It's good to speculate about God, see a landscape of possibilities, generate multiple models as to how God might be. The God of the philosophers is not the God of Abraham. So different landscapes, different models of God? God is needy, so God is a person? God is manifest in many forms, so God is not simple? 
Ultimism provides existence, value, and salvation. So ultimism supersedes theism? I agree that philosophers can define God so loosely as to enhance God's existence but degrade God's significance. I like tension between God's existence and God's significance because it highlights how analytical approaches to God work. While convergence is not coming, it is not blasphemy to speculate widely, even wildly, about God. God, if there is a God, would appreciate, yes, enjoy, humans speculating about their creator, balances the relationship, levels the playing field. While I more clearly see the landscape of possibilities of what God might be like, I doubt that I am any closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.